Hey, everybody. My name is TJ, TJ Van Toll. I work as a developer advocate at Blues Wireless. And welcome to React Wednesdays. If you're new here, this is a stream we do every week on Wednesdays, What Do You Know?, where we bring in cool people from around the React world, from around the JavaScript, and really the front-end world in general, and talk to them about the cool stuff that they're doing, try to learn something new. If you are new here, I'm going to toss a link to the show in the chat so you can catch up on upcoming episodes, watch previous episodes. We have ways of adding calendar invites, all that good type of stuff. If you're watching this on YouTube, hi, YouTube. That same link is going to be right down there in the description. So it's telerec.com slash react dash Wednesdays, and you can check that out. This week, we have a very exciting guest. I want to welcome to React Wednesdays, Adam Argyle. Adam, how's it going, man? Welcome to React Wednesdays. <laughs> it's going good. Thanks for uh, having me on. I'm excited. Yeah. Do you want to tell people just to start who you are, what you do, why you're famous, all those good sorts of things? I will tell you what I do. Um, and I don't know how famous things happen um, <laughs> other than being working at Google. Working at Google kind of immediately puts you in um, a visibility status. Uh, but I have been in the Chrome DevRel team for a couple of years now. I think that is really what it took is just sort of being visible for that long. I don't know. Anyway, um, I specialize though in CSS. I really, I build front ends. I've been building front ends for like 20 years. I love making just tangible, silky, beautiful interfaces. I just love it. Every little detail that it takes to get there, um, I just obsess over that stuff. And then I take a lot of my learning and a lot of my observations from watching y'all in these episodes, watching people build stuff, watching what's kind of trending, and trying to help CSS adopt those good properties. Or maybe I make a library to help people get into sort of modern workflows. Or maybe, I, anyway, so yeah, we'll talk about one of those things in just a minute. Yeah, I um, imagine. Me. Yeah, I, I think one of the cool things, probably from working at Google, I wouldn't know, but like, I feel like your ability to tell just random people what you do, like, probably goes up a bit. Like, if you say you work at Google versus like the companies I've worked for, well, while I think they're cool, like, nobody has ever heard of them. So I can't just like talk to somebody on a train and be like, yeah, I work for Blues Wireless, like, you know, the blank stares, right? <laughs> nobody knows. Uh, the guys. opposite is kind of weird too, though, where it's like, I work for Google and everyone's like, oh, God, I need to change the way I act around you. And I'm like, no, you don't. Um, and then some people don't even like saying the word Google. They're just like, you work for Googs. And I'm like, you mean Google? And they're like, no, Googs. I'm like, OK. <laughs> so it's like it has a weird thing to it sometimes. So it's double-edged sword, right, as always. But yeah, I like this company a lot. I'm having a great time. <laughs> cool. Well, we have you on because you have a very cool library that, that definitely caught my attention called Open Props, right? I, I am saying that correctly. And I it, it is fascinating to me just because it's such a unique approach. And I, I'll let you, why don't you just give the 101, explain like what it is because you can do it better than I can. Sure, 101. Well, here we could even pull up the share my screen so you can kind of see some stuff. But yeah, there it we go. is, um, if you've ever written Val of like variables or custom properties in your project, and then they kind of stack up, and you've got all these light colors and dark colors and brand colors and sizes and border radiuses and maybe shadows and sort of like you've found yourself building this sort of like design system or tokens inside of your CSS over and over again. Every project is sort of rehashing, trying a new naming strategy, um, trying new techniques, adding new things or whatever, and it just sort of morphs and, and follows you? Well, open props is essentially me identifying all of those things that keep traveling with me across projects. I've identified a lot of failed naming strategies and <laughs> have sort of presented a, a, an open source version of what I see everybody doing all the time over and over again. And I just was like, well, let's stop doing it over and over again. Let's align. Maybe I, you don't have to here, but align on this um, set of very agnostic global CSS variables. Some of them are very simple. They might just hold a color and other ones might hold an entire clamp or an entire calculation that is very dynamic and very rich, very hard to understand, but makes a really nice named variable, you know, like fluid typography three or something like that font fluid size three. You're like, okay, well, I'll just try that on. It's like a user. You're like, oh, I, I want some fluid typography. If one is the small fluid font size and three is the large fluid font size, uh, then you don't have to worry about what it took to get there. That's something that I did or that will do in the uh, library itself. So this also plays into like shadows. 
shadows are easy at first, but to make beautiful shadows, it's hard to make tinted shadows that have like a brand hue in them is hard. And then to make it uh, work in light and dark, you have to have an adaptive shadow uh, and that stuff gets really difficult. And so open props just is observing and hardening patterns over time. And it's got new stuff on the way, but that's its goal. Just values named values so that they read like what they do. So you don't have to go decode the CSS to understand it's trying to make a conditional border radius. Uh, it's just called conditional border radius one, two, three, or four. Um, same thing with gradients. You got like super amazing gradients and open props. You don't have to know the syntax. You just know that uh, there's 30 pre-made beautiful ones and you can try gradient one, gradient two, gradient three until you find yourself in a beautiful gradient for your design. So that's sort of the workflow it's going towards is uh, handing you beautiful global CSS web centric. That's another thing. These are very web centric um, tokens. Anyway, it's the fact that it's tokens is the thing that really hits you in the face, right? Because CSS frameworks, I don't even know if you'd call this a framework or a library, uh, but like the, the problem you're trying to solve isn't in and of itself new, right? Like we've, there, there's been CSS frameworks for almost since the beginning of the web, uh, like bootstrap, or like you could even call things like normalize or like all these different approaches, more like modernly yeah. like tailwind. But the model that I think people are used to, or that you know, I, I'm used to is, well, there's some CSS library I need. Well, okay. I got to bring in their CSS file. I put them in and then there's like some classes that I put on. Let my... the battle begin is essentially what happens, right? You're like, <laughs> yeah. And like, then there's all sorts of approaches we've come up for like, okay, what's the best way to, to manage that, right? Like extending these frameworks and uh, naming, con naming conventions is a whole, a whole conversation in and of itself. But yeah. with this, like just the code, like instantly jumps out at you is like, wait a second, I'm bringing in like variables tokens here right instead so i'm curious like what led you to that specific like technological decision and how does that actually like play out in a in a bigger app yeah okay well big question but i'll start with the first part of this like how did i arrive here i have a project oh here let me open it up Tran transition dot style and these are um, ready-made click and go transitions so this transition starts in the top right as a circle grows um, and you can click to preview, but if you click over here, like in circle and here in circle center, let's say you want that. If I hit uh, command T and paste, I just pasted all the CSS that you need for that. So this website that I built is essentially trying to just give you stuff without even making you download anything. It's like, how do you need a transition? Visit this site, find the transition you want. When you clicked it, you now have the styles. Um, but one of the things that I did in there was everything was broken out into custom properties internally in the library. And so if we go to GitHub and find the hack pack, this was V1, you could think of, of this idea of just shipping props. Okay. Um, the hack pack is just the custom properties. Yeah, custom properties ship with each min file. So like if you import this, like you can use it from NPM and install and stuff. Um, but the idea was if I ship you just the props, you can actually make way more combinations of transitions than you get with this library. Um, as long as you're willing to take upon yourself uh, a little bit of usage of custom properties and some naming. And there's like a, a little hack pack sandbox here uh, where you can see that like I just import I don't know if folks yeah, can, can you see bump that. up the, the font size a little bit. And also, by the way, yeah. I, I I found your transition site too, and I threw it in the chat. If people want to toy around with it, it's nice. fun just to click. It's just fun just to click the links, actually. <laughs> I think so too. <laughs> or keyboard hit tab space, tab space, tab space, go nuts. Uh... Um, right. Dun, 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 dun. So then we got. Um, so here we are. I'm just in, importing the the props, and then I make an animation. So it's called Swoopy uh, from this circle top right out to circle bottom right in. So I've just given you some custom properties that represent a clip path state. You decide the states from and to, and then you just use it. You just use it and you can set your own duration. How long should it take, et cetera. I think let's hear, let's reload the page. Maybe we'll see it kick off. Uh, or yeah, why aren't we see? Oh, look, there's like a hang. And CSS here. Do I have a bug? And yeah, get out of here, block font. That thing's been haunting my life for a long time. Look, there's our transition. <laughs> I won't even go into where that block font came from. <laughs> anyway, it doesn't exist anymore. So it blocks the whole page and we weren't seeing our demo, but uh, that's the demo here where you can just, so this was how it started. I was like, why are people just shipping more custom properties? I'm like, it's kind of cool to do 
Um, there's so much power you can tuck into a custom property. Like, look at what we got here. A totally custom animation with just an import. Well, that's um, the thing. That's the thing that got me too. Because when I first saw the site, I was thinking like, oh, there's going to be variables for like, uh, you know, like font and sizing and, and stuff. And then I kept scrolling and like, because you have on the site, like a, a list of the different things that you can do here. And there's a lot. There is a lot and that's, and it's only growing. Look at the stuff coming soon. Um, like here's a little demo of icons. Oh, we are in the jumbo size now. Uh, can I shrink down? Yeah, there we go. We'll put it at that size. But these are uh, like, imagine you imported um, just some icons from, so you'd be like uh, unpackage, open prop slash, you know, maybe skull icons or like the skull icon pack or something and it, to use it. You would just set it as a mask here. So here's the mat. Let me pump this up. Yeah. Yeah. I need the text a little bit bigger. My glasses and it looks like this. <laughs> so you imported some properties. You're like, okay, I want it to be a skull and filled with this gradient. That's it. So you got two custom properties that give you this super cool looking skull over here, uh, which we can't even scroll to. Let me make it smaller. Here's size 10. Let's go to size five. Maybe that'll be something reasonable. Oh, that was too small, but whatever. Here, we'll go size seven. Oh, I guess 10, it's... were we in like a zoom state? Oh, there we go. Anyway. Yeah, it's it's yeah. it's very interesting. It, it almost, to me, like, so Tailwind is quite popular, right, for sort of sprinkling classes into your markup. I almost view this as like, a similar sort of approach, except you're doing it at the CSS level. I don't know if you like that comparison now, but that's sort of what it feels like to me. Like I'm like, I've got a handful of handy tokens or like little things that I can drop into my CSS files for like consistency or just, just to do cool things in a small amount of code. Yeah. It, uh, it often gets compared to Tailwind at first, because I think that's, one of Tailwind's benefits is pre-defined -de amazing design tokens that you can trust, that they always look good. Um, that's only half of what Tailwind's really amazing at. Like I think the other two big features are people want to work in a template because they're in a JavaScript framework and all they're doing is messing with their template and the behavior all day. So they're like, why don't I just move it all right there? And value prop number two, if you create an atomic style sheet, it never grows. You could make 10,000 web pages with a one style sheet that just doesn't change. That's an incredible value proposition. Um, but yeah, at the at the beginning though, you're just like, I don't wanna think, I want some beautiful gradients, I want some beautiful colors, I want reasonable typography, uh, some reasonable spacing. Basically like give me a little bit of some constriction in my options so that I naturally become, what do I say at the top of this? It's like incidentally, uh, yeah, look, Designed consistently, <laughs> inc incidentally harmonious. Like you're like, I didn't try that hard. I just used only the props available, and I ended up designing consistently. Um, and yeah, I think that that's kind of a, a good place to start. But it branches off uh, a pretty quick once you realize, yeah, you have to name things. That's a wait. There's value proposition number four, Tailwind. Don't have to name anything, as yeah. all the classes are already named, right? And so you have to name stuff in this still. Uh, you have to write CSS selectors, but there's a whole lot of people that are writing CSS. Maybe they're using CSS modules, so they're not naming anything. Um, but still, I think that we're moving towards this really like just CSS props are so dynamic. Um, and now that we're like not looking at IE, IE used to make custom properties look um, not possible to use. We're just in this new time when we want props and the props work really well in CSS and they work in any framework and any, so it's like, lower level, um, but a wider cast of who can use it. Whereas like Tailwind starts to make you make a lot of choices. Um, anyway, I, I rambled a bit there, but yeah. No, it, it makes sense to me. And I, the reason I find it interesting too is, so I, I'm i a long time JavaScript developer and, it, and I'm like sort of a casual CSS developer, right? Like I, I know CSS decently because I've been doing it for 15 years or whatever at this point. But I, I think I'm like most JavaScript developers in that never taken the time to like super learn CSS, right? So I do lots of times lean on some of these frameworks for people that know this stuff a little bit better than me. But it's funny because 
even when I think I'm going to share like some CSS, even though I know like CSS variables are very much a thing, I still reach to things like like SAS variables or, or something like that for sharing. Or I, I think the other thing too is I wouldn't think to use these variables for the breadth of things you're using them for just because like I wouldn't have even thought like, oh, an animation is something that I can leverage a CSS variable to do. Like I would just hard code the crap out of that if I were writing that in my own app. And the same thing for like some of the layout things as well. Like maybe I'd put a breakpoint in a variable, but you're taking this to like a whole, a whole nother level. Yeah, it's a good point you bring up where um, like Tailwind, again, it's like an easy place for us to compare. Um, it has spacing classes and they're tied directly to margin or padding. And, you know, like, uh, and that's its value proposition. It's like a little bundle. You use the class, you get this like bundle of styles. Um, and you don't get that with open props. You still have to go, all I give you are size variables. And I'm like, use them wherever you want. There's actually two different, there's three different types. There's like generic sizes that just ramp up in a nice linear scale. There's content sizes where I'm like, here's the reading size of content. You should be making your content like your paragraph blocks. Size them based on legibility. So here's three different sizes of legibility. And then here's three header sizes. Um, and yeah, it's kind of a different way. Like I'm giving you these low level, I call them, what I call them subatomic styles. Yeah, they're like subatomic level styles and you could put them anywhere. You can use these uh, for gaps. Uh, you can use these for margins, paddings, insets, absolute positioning, et cetera. Like these things um, are much more free and nimble. Um, but they, again, yeah, they don't come with a nice, a nice little bundled set of behavior. So there's definitely trade-offs in this, but um, yeah. Yeah, and it sounds like really like there's a bit more manual work involved with the open props approach, right? Because you're still very much writing CSS. This is like uh, a series of things you can reach for to like, as you say, like um, enforce consistently, sort of maybe even accidentally as you go along. But I, yeah. I think it's like... Uh, because you had said earlier too, like a whole lot of people write CSS and they're writing CSS for various reasons. They're writing CSS with different, I guess, like levels of comfort, background levels, et cetera. Uh, I, I guess too, like, where do you think is the best fit for this? Like, I, I, I imagine anybody could use like open props, but to me, it's like, it seems like you wouldn't want someone who, like the people that want like to, I want to put a CSS file and for my app to instantly look like pretty might not be for that person. It's more for somebody that wants to like build, like knows a bit of CSS and wants to build something that's more like robust and maintainable, or at least that's the sense that I'm getting. Yeah, it's you definitely are, you're going to be more opinionated. So you have uh, your, yeah, and you're writing your own CSS. Um, I think that it, yeah, if you're looking for just a drop in file to sort of make things look pretty, that's not what this does yet though community contributors could definitely make some sort of um, opinionated style um, layers built on top of this. But there is, there's a lot more manual usage. And what's interesting about that manual usage is it's like, it's like really easy to get started because you can import it from a URL, you can install it from NPM, you can get the JavaScript variables. So if you're uh, really heavy into JavaScript authoring, you can reference these directly from um, JavaScript. Um, and I, I don't know what the optimal way to use it is, but I think one of the best ways to use it is, I see two different kind of really great ways. One is dynamically building an atomic style sheet on the fly with like sprinkles, or um, there's like a couple things coming out that do this where they'll evaluate your CSS creations with like, you know, the CSS modules, and then they'll break them up into little atomic classes and then dynamically build you an atomic style sheet on the fly. And I think that works really nice with um, open props because open props brings these named um, high shareable values. And then you have a system that's building a nice, robust, tight, small atomic style sheet that'll never grow. Um, that's one really cool workflow. Um, another one I have is here where I have a plugin that I made here. Let me bump this one up again. This time we're in Stack Blitz. So this is a Vite app. Let me just come over here to styles. Oh, oh, we can check the post CSS config. The idea here is that you grab this post CSS plugin called JIT props. I mean, JIT props will watch as you use CSS variables, find them from a pool that you provide. So here's the pool. I'm providing all of open props to the plugin here when I initialize. And as it discovers those, it will put them in your style sheet. So instead of like importing all these variables and then only using half of them, 
you can import all the variables, put them into a pool, and this intelligent plugin will go pop them in one by one as you use them. So you get this style sheet that's built off of your usage. Um, and I find that to be a really powerful way to work as well. One of the reasons that that might be better than an atomic style sheet is uh, adaptability, where you've got um, media queries like light and dark, motion, no motion, contrast, all, all sorts of things that can impact the way a variable might be represented. And when you use custom properties from like the ground up and you're using this sort of additive mentality, um, you just can build yourself a really nice, succinct and dynamic and adaptive um, style system just from scratch. It feels very manual, but it's also very, um, it's like helping you out a whole bunch. Um, so yeah, I see those as two of the best ways if you're concerned about performance or importing too many variables. But at the end of the day, this style sheet, the main bundle is 4K or something like that. It's really tiny, uh, imported from a CDN. And you could just start a new HTML file, pop that in and go to town. You could start a new React app, import that file and go to town. <laughs> it's like, really unlimited that way but at the same time yeah you're right you're still gonna have to write css and be kind of manual about it like it doesn't have display grid with grid template columns anywhere for you i don't have utility classes that do that so you're gonna have to bring your own grid and flexbox code and then open props can help you with like background colors gaps border radiuses uh, content sizes like we were talking earlier but yeah it is the more we talk about it the more weird it starts to sound um, yeah, I, I wouldn't say weird. I, I think it's like um, it's you, I think, you know, your audience pretty well, too, because like even looking at what you what you have here, this is probably a bit I'd say this is definitely overkill for just like somebody's random like pet project. Right. Because for that, let's just ship whatever CSS to the browser. Right. Like it's 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 not yeah. going to make a world of difference. But when you start getting into like business use cases where, hey, like performance becomes performance is money, right? The faster everything loads, the more people purchase, the more people make money. All of a sudden, yeah. some process that can identify uh, CSS that's being used and optimize that intelligently is a far bigger deal. And anybody who's tried to do that manually knows that that is not fun. Like, I, I think that's one of the reasons why yeah. we end up with so many frameworks is because historically recognizing in dead CSS and maintaining that and proactively addressing that has been awful, quite frankly. Yeah, it's, it's been it's... error prone, like the the purge CSS or just CSS removal after you've done all this stuff. And you're, it's really, I don't know, it feels brittle, right? You're like, okay, I have to tell this little scraper engine every HTML file, every JavaScript file so that it can go read every string that it can and then scrub my CSS to see if it's in there or not. Like, ooh, okay. Well, and, and to me too, that's like kind of what's behind the rise of CSS and JavaScript too is because people want their styles associated right with the, the code that's using it, partially because yeah. it stays right there. And then if that component goes away, it's CSS goes away as well. But then obviously, like CSS and JavaScript has its own issues to deal with that because then all of a sudden it's a little bit weird that your JavaScript is controlling all of your styling too. So there's trade offs with all of these things. But I think it's trying to attack yeah. the same sort of problem. Yeah, it wants to be wherever you work. Open props is just like, here's great values for wherever you're working right now. It could be Angular, it could be Svelte, um, it could be no framework. It is trying to just. Yeah, and that's yeah, that's what's nice about being so low level. It doesn't have to try to get into those places. It should be easy to bring those into those environments. Yeah. But you might go back to the website and just walking through some of the the features again. I'd be curious to of course. to see them and get like your sort of take on take take yes. as well. You got it. So it says expertly crafted web design tokens, and that just means that um, I've been on the web a long time, I've vetted lots of different techniques and lots of different styles and lots of different all sorts. And so you're kind of getting um, a lot of my experience built into these tokens. Yeah, I create consistent components. And yep, like we've been talking, it's useful anywhere. We have a card example here where it shows the border rated three. So you want fluid sizes. I don't know if you've ever written those. They're really not fun to write. And they also yeah. can um, be awkward. Like maybe they, they, they're fluid really great at a mobile size, but they're terribly fluid at a desktop size. And you're like, which, eh. Um, and so this one did its best to make these fluid sizes as they go from like reasonable scales 
Um, and then, yeah, you just use it like that. So you have like fluid padding on something just because you just tucked that on there. We have a box shadow. So we've talked about the shadows are really powerful. And look, you can hover and lift the shadow. We'll go from shadow two to shadow three in a nice little uh, selector here. And then down at the bottom, we have if motion is okay. So this does ship with some custom media, which we can talk about maybe. Um, and then you just write animation fade in. And it should be that easy. So this custom property here comes with the animation name, a duration, and all the stuff that it needs in order to run. Uh, and then the keyframes are present as well so that the keyframes that it's referencing um, come in. Yeah. I was just going to say on fluid sizes, um, that's one of those things that you probably don't want to write your own unless you really know what you're doing. I know like you, uh, I've the trap I always fall into is I, I think I do it right, but then like it looks wrong between like certain sizes. So then I'm writing these like band-aid media queries that are brittle and feel, feel bad. So if anybody watching this is right into that, that's probably a sign that you need to like Google fluid design and find something to help you. Yeah, it's really hard. I've made four or five systems. I've seen other people who publish their fluid system. They're like, here's my ultimate fluid system. And in a year, they've abandoned it. They're like really unpredictable. Fluid, anyway, that's a whole conversation. It's like fluid yeah. fonts and fluid sizing. You're like, do you really want to have a hundred design states between this screen and that screen? Or did you actually just want three? Um, so anyway, that's a whole other question, but it does make it really easy to use. Like Oprah Props is like, I don't, I don't care if you want to use fluid sizes or not. I'll give you the props that you need. Um, yeah, let's see what other features are in here. We've got uh, that's just a whole bunch of examples from building the site. Usage is pretty easy. So right, we have CDN, NPM. You can also um, use the CLI to custom build one. Here's instructions on using the post CSS JIT props plugin, which we were just looking at that adds some as you use them and then some autocomplete in VS code. But yeah, okay, let's talk about the colors. Like this is kind of interesting because um, most people use color, like they'll do like blue 400 or blue uh, dark blue, right? These are probably the two most common ways to name your colors. It's like darker blue, dark blue, darkest blue. Blue. Anyway, it starts to get weird. Um, it also gets weird when you flip to uh, a dark mode because now all of your dark blues need to be light blues, but you have to reference them with the dark blue name. Yeah. Anyway, uh, and we can talk about how you can get around that also with just naming um, your custom properties, but that'll be a conversation of in-house props versus your global props. But I went with this really succinct naming where it's just gray zero. Gray zero was going to be the lightest gray. Red zero is the lightest red. And if we look down here, these are not white. These are very, very close to white. They're just super pastel-y. Um, and I thought that was important that I didn't uh, give you a white color. I just gave you something really light that was still useful in building a UI. Uh, and then here in the dark colors are the nines. So if you're trying to create a hover effect where you want it to go darker on hover, you just increase the number. If you want it to lighten on hover, you decrease the numbers. You could go from you know, green eight to green nine would be a darker hover. So some kind of predictability as well as really succinct. I was like, why are you telling me to use blue 400? What happened to blue one through 399? Like, are those options? You make it sound like they're an option uh, and they're not. So it's kind of, I, I broke that pattern. That pattern's been in the design world for 15 years. And I was like, it's a dumb pattern though. So let's <laughs> stop using it. Um, and yeah, the colors are also piggybacking on a, um, I've vetted so many different color systems. I've even tried to, I tried to create, I think I went through like nine iterations trying to beat this one. I wanted to make a better one than this. Um, and I couldn't. So I was like, I'm just gonna use theirs. It's so good. There's a lot of thought that's going gone into this. I feel like the vibrancy levels of these colors is out of this world. They're so candy, juicy feeling, kind of like the Tailwind ones. Like you can see them and they just have this vibrancy on them. Yep. Um, anyway, I went and borrowed the, oh, look, and they have gray zero through nine. Did they change that? Maybe they were inspired they by you. That. Maybe. I think I had to remap those when I built it, so... I'll, I'd be curious. 1.9.1 is the one I used. So anyway, uh, those are the colors. And that's some of the reasons uh, to think about them that way. And I have this little tip here about usage because check this out. This is really fun. Like if we come and grab uh, here, this background color on the summary. So we've got this background for our surface three. I don't know how much you can see that. I'm going to go um, 
Here we'll just do blue. And look, as I type blue, look at all the blues fill out. And now I can just step through all oh, of the really blues handy. in my code editor. Uh, and you can do that with sizes and with all the different things. So having the numbers in a sequential order like that, following that pattern makes it really nice for autocomplete. That is actually really slick. I didn't even think about that um, as a potential option, but it's almost like a, you know, TypeScript or whatever, just, just code complete for your CSS. And I imagine too, like when you say about the the consistency, just like almost accidental consistency, presumably you recommend that if you're going to use these tokens to use them for like everything, right? Or like within within reason, but I imagine like you probably shouldn't have any exceptions, right? Like your colors should be within this palette. Um, and I, I imagine similarly with sizing and stuff as well, right? I think so. And yeah, if we go look at sizing, it is kind of hard though. Like the colors here do lack, I have an open issue against the repo. They lack really strong dark colors. Like if I'm in a dark theme and I'm trying to build a really dark button, um, these aren't the best. They're almost still a little too vibrant. And that was one of the other things I tried to improve was could I make 10, 11, 12, and 13 <laughs> go shades of darker? Yeah. And I think that I think that will eventually uh, happen. But sizes is interesting though too. So I have um, 15. And that was a really interesting thing to try to get to because I was like, and here, here they all are. Well, we're super zoomed in, but you know, I've got some really large ones and they they scale really well if we were just sort of like looking at them in a line. Um, but yeah, I don't think that you'll need to break out of these, but it's CSS. And so there are times where you need these like little magic units, you know, like a minus two pixels to fix some position relative icon shenanigan, you know, like maybe flex align center is like, it's doing it's centering, but your icon is off and you're like, ah, I gotta go fix the icon top two pixels or whatever, and nudge it back down into the center. That stuff is fine. I think those things are natural. That's also attention to detail that you're like, I need to go fix some inconsistencies. Just name those variables, by the way, everyone. Like, don't put negative two pixels somewhere. Be like, this is like centering top offset. And then you can go use it. Someone's reading your code going, oh, now I know why that's a magical two pixels is they're centering the offset. Um, but yeah, having this list should cover 95 or more percent of what you're using um, and it becomes really nice like if you put padding in in line at like padding three and then you need something to go uh negative back onto the edge of that you can just use the same variable of r3 you calculate it times negative one and you got yourself uh the exact offset of the one that you went in on and it can be really nice that way um hopefully these are all here for you yeah and i think like having a limited set of options is nice from just like a javascript developer's perspective as well because oftentimes at least my situation is i'll get something like from a designer from a ux person that says build this lots of times it doesn't have like here's the exact padding and margin you should have i mean sometimes they'll have that specified but lots of times it's just like here's a picture you know you're the developer figure it out sort of thing yeah and sometimes you're like you you've got like one monitor with the thing you're building and one monitor where it's at and you're like all right, well, t you know, I'm, I'm two two rems looks like that's not quite enough. But man, if one is definitely not enough. And then you're like, oh, man, so am I going like 1.75? What am I actually doing here? Right. And it just feels dirty. Like, what am I even doing with my life? And having like a code complete where I could say like, okay, is this a one, two, three, four? Or usually you'd say like, okay, is that a three or a four? Right. You're, you'd only be debating between two. I think it makes yeah. life way easier <laughs> i think so too um and they're shareable we recently made it so that this can be imported into figma figma doesn't know how to deal with a rem but it's at least nice that they're shareable there um because yeah i agree the role of a front-end developer is often translation someone yeah. worked in pixels and that's not how the web works i mean you can use the web in pixels but you sort of circumvent a lot of its nice flexibility that way um and so yeah you can share these up to the designer maybe they'll use them but I, I think it's a good idea to continually translate their harmonious look into a harmonious code as well. Like uh, that is a lot of our role. And hopefully these help you there. There are, if you notice, yeah, look, one, 1 1.25, 1 1.5, 1 1.75, and two. That's the primary zone where those, I, this is just from experience. I need those. There's like so many weird scenarios where yeah, 1.25 rem is wrong uh, and 1.5 rem is right. It's worth noting too, these negative values. 
I don't like using negatives in in CSS, but with sizes, these are common things that I had happen where I needed to just shave off a small amount of something or shave off another little small amount. So I have these concepts of zeros where double zero and triple zero. These are, um, whenever you see these in open props where there's also line height zero, think of them as slightly dangerous. Like <laughs> use these at your own, uh, you know, you could you could be breaking something. You could make something illegible with these, um, and so they're they're not shunned. I think they're necessary, but they're not part of this main workflow of one through whatever. Um, I don't know. That was like a really hard, weird thing to think about because I wasn't going to do size negative one. You know, there'd be two dashes in there. Um, so anyway, yeah, the the zeros. We'll see them in a few other places, but that's what they're there for. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, that's like most of software development, right? H handling the edge and the, the the crazy cases. Like, I, I liked what you said, too, about occasionally needing sizes that fit outside this. It, But you kind of like need a good reason for it. Like, don't like willy nilly do yeah. it. But if, if you can justify like, OK, because of this circumstance, it's just going to be weird. And I just need to bump it three pixels because this stupid icon that I'm getting from a third party is this big and I, or, you know, whatever, then yeah, yeah. Great, do it. But put a comment, name a variable, do something to tell people why you're doing it. And you know, at the end of the day, we have to ship software. So you want to be consistent, but you can't be too dogmatic uh, because otherwise you'd never get past some of these weird scenarios that always come up. Yeah. Yeah. The animations you mentioned, those are kind of weird. Um, they're, they're keyframe effects. So like if we go look at what one of these is defined as, it's just one keyframe. So it's using at keyframes, but there aren't two states inside of there. And that is kind of weird for people to think about and use, but that's what allows us to combine them. So if we wanted to do a slide fade, we can fade out and slide down at the same time um, by just specifying two animations. So the engine is smart enough to zip those together and merge them. Uh, and then we can change the timing function with the nice handy open props easings. This was also one of the first things, these easings, I was like, this is super valuable. Easings are tough to write. By cubic quartz yep. quant <laughs> crap doesn't make sense to me. Um, and they also stink. I'm like, they look good in the curve. You're like, yeah, I want that sharp curve. And then you go use it and you're like, ugh, that was you, way too sharp. You math. Yeah. You math. And yeah, you go to Leo Veru's curve editor um, and that's confusing. I spent a lot of good time in there, though. That's where I did all the authoring of these. Um, but anyway, yeah, you can combine them together. So we just fade out and slide down at the same time, set the duration to one second, because these come with a duration inside of them, but this can normalize it. So this smashes both of them into a one second transition. And I like the one set, like increase your duration when you're using a more extreme easing. You'll just get a more fluid effect. And yeah, here's one shake in. We shake Y, we fade in, and we slide in left. Shake in. You can do all of these, whatever you want. Like push out. That used to be a lot of CSS to write, and now it's just scale out, fade out, and do it with a squishy ease. You know, boom, look at it squish as it sort of boings its way out there. Um, this, yeah, yeah, this is sort of breaking my brain a little bit, uh, like you said, because I would have never thought to do this. But I guess it makes sense. You just combine them, or you, they're, it's a comma separated list, right? So as long as the browser yep. can parse it, it can do its thing. Uh, yeah, they're just individual requests. They're like, so all of them say where to go. There's, um, which two is the same thing as 100%. So yeah, this is where things get a little technicals, it's going to animate the element from wherever it is now, because you're not specifying a from, you're yeah. just saying where it should be. Um, and you'll notice in a lot of these two, they specify forwards, they pass the directionality because they want the playhead to stop, right? This one, we want it to slide fade out and then stay there. Um, and so to do that, we tell it to go forward. So play this thing forwards, so the fade out ends with it stays faded out. Um, yeah, really interesting. I have a couple of code pens that you can open up to that just show like basics of um, popping open, uh, like starting open props, just importing the animations and the easings and just using those. Cause maybe that's all you need for your project. Like that's something about open props too that folks don't realize at first is that you don't have to pull them all in. This isn't the thing that you use to start a new project only. It's not a brand new design token set that you can't use unless you start it from scratch. Like you can bring in these easings, bring in these animations, 
bring in just the aspect ratios or whatever it is, um, you can get those individually. And I think it's a really interesting value proposition of open props is this sort of a la carte, um, you know, uh, it's ability, I don't know, anyway. Yeah, no, for sure. You can, you can use it as little or as much as makes sense to you. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah. What else do we have? And we have borders. So the borders are just kind of interesting. So we have border sizes, radiuses. We have a named radius round because I know everyone's like, okay, I need a circle. And you're like, oh, well, now you can just use radius round, a uh, radius blob and radius conditional. So we have, here's the border sizes, one through five, border radiuses, one through five, and then round here. <laughs> free blobs that these are just ready to go border radius blobs oh that's kind of um, fun I, i've never seen them called that before uh but i could see where nice. you, i totally see where you could use those check out the syntax down here <laughs> radius blobs here they are and so you can see the slash here in the middle um and that's the extended border radius syntax. It allows you to not treat a corner radius symmetrically, because usually when you change a value like five pixels, it'll you know it'll make new little points in both directions on a corner. But this allows you to put one way over here and one really short, and that okay. allows you to make a weird blob. Um, yeah, we have condition. Look, okay, here's the conditional ones. Oh, here's radius round. So this is fun syntax, and most people don't know exists. But one e five picks. I have no idea what That's that means. I've never valid seen that before. CSS. Is that exponential um, notation in there or? It is. Yeah. I think JavaScript does it too. 1E5. Yeah. Okay. So here's 1E5. Down at the bottom, it's showing us. Of, can you see that zoom in? I can. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. Cool. I should use that more often. Um, 1E5 is the same thing as one with five zeros. So you're just setting the border radius to an arbitrarily huge number to force a circle? Yes. Exactly. Okay. okay. And it has to be a. Um, of like a absolute value and not a relative value in order to always be round. Um, like if you use 50%, um, if your element's not as like a one by one square, it won't be a circle. And this um, one E5 pixel, since it's such a large value, will always just curve every corner as much as it can. It's just like this like super curve. Um, but yeah, you you see maybe other people writing like nine 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 pixels. Yeah. And I'm like, why? It's more fun to write 1e5 pixels. And then I can go to six. I'm like, oh, is 1e5 not enough? How about 1e10? Whoa, I just doubled it. It's so much bigger. Um, anyway. Can impress um, your friends. I can impress your friends or just confuse them. And look, it's actually used here in the clamp for uh, radius conditional. So we have clamp at zero pixels. We calculate if the, uh, the current element is the same width of the viewport we have 100 viewport wide minus 100 percent times a giant number this middle one causes it to pick either the lower one or the upper one so we're either going to have a radius or we're not going to have a radius depending on if this element's width is the width of 100 vw and that's how you do the conditional ones so yeah. wait why would you want to use a conditional can you scroll down to where those are i don't think i've ever yeah, heard they're, the term they're not demonstrated Okay, cool. They're not demonstrated here. That's uh, this was made popular a few months ago uh, by Ahmad Shadid, who found it on Facebook. And the reason Facebook was using it, like I think I, hopefully all the zoomed in works. Oh, look, we have one right here. Okay, see this usage example? It's now fitting full width, and we don't have a border radius. So if I select these, I can find this style. Uh, oh, look, border radius zero. Oh, I capped it out myself. I probably should be using my own. Oh, here's border radius conditional. Ooh, let's take out border radius zero. Oh, good. We don't need that. Okay. I was like, I should just go log a bug on my uh, tool here or, or the docs. I don't know what this was targeting, but anyway, uh, the idea is when this element, as soon as it reaches the full width, oh, this is going to be hard to demo. It, okay. So here, look, the one above it has rounded corners. Oh, and this one doesn't. Okay. So conditional border radius. I see. It is tricky stuff. And yeah, you have six to choose from. So basically it's all the radiuses that you have to choose from, but made conditional. So I'm curious too, that's probably a decent segue because to the words like um, aspect ratios, like media queries, those sorts of things, which I assume are in here in some capacity as well. Yep, here's aspect ratios. 
box, landscape, portrait, widescreen, ultra wide, and the golden ratio. Dilly do. <laughs> and yeah, I thought this read really nice. So right, aspect ratio, make it widescreen. Yep. Why do we have to remember all of these weird ratios when you just give them a name? Um, let's see, what was the other one you're talking about? Oh, it's media like queries. Media yeah, we can check yeah. that really quick. Have you checked this area out yet much? No. It, don't worry, most people haven't. This is a, a more forgotten zone of <laughs> of uh, open props. And for me, it's I use it pretty much every time I'm building something. And what you're doing here is there's a spec um, for custom media queries so that you can basically stash them. It's just like SAS and stylus can do. You can stash a media query in a variable and then use it very easily. And we saw that at the very top where I had like um, at media dash dash motion okay. And that would be using this one right here, right here. So this is how you define them. And then you can just use it by its little short name. So you don't have to remember prefers reduced motion reduce is motion's not okay and prefers, oh, look, it's right here. But anyway, um, this just gives it a nice little succinct name. Um, and I ship a whole file full of these. And what's cool about that is eventually when the spec is supported in browsers, you'll import this file and just have them available. For now, you need to use this post CSS plugin though, which essentially unpacks them. So it'll discover your usage of them and then replace them with the media query the browsers do understand. But um, I think it sets up this nice, um, you know, use case where people are going to be making lots of media queries, just like they've been writing properties and sizes and colors and bringing those along, you know, to new projects. Same thing with media queries. And I tried to, again, take my knowledge of all the bad naming conventions that have, I've used and other people have used trying to name their custom media queries and create a little system that I think is nice. So we have like portrait and landscape. That one's really not that valuable, but check these out. Medium only, medium and above medium and below and medium phone. So each uh, size, which we have extra, extra small, extra small, me small, medium, large, extra, large, extra, extra, large, which are shown here. If you're wondering what those equate to, you know, 240 pixels, which is like a watch or a go phone, like a little tiny phone or up to a really uh, wide monitor. And so, yeah, you can each one of these different sizes of screens, you can target just that screen size that one and above, that one and below, and that one if it's just on phone. So you're basically checking medium only plus portrait, right? Uh, which is kind of interesting, a little bit of a cheat, but I think it works for most of the time. And yeah, it's, I supply a whole bunch of those. Plus, it's been, it's been interesting yeah. as you go through this, sorry, that I think one of the, the real benefits of this approach is how composable it makes these sort of rules because I, I've noticed you even use them within the library itself to like build on top of each other, but you can just oh, yeah. totally toss these together and like, whereas if everything were based off just like CSS rules or selectors that you're bringing in, can't, it's much harder, I should say, to compose. Whereas since these are pretty low level, uh, you can do fun things like this, like medium and below is pretty powerful, but also pretty easy to implement because you have all these tokens available too, which is, I think, kind of slick. Awesome. I, you know, that helps me realize one of the value props of open props. It, well, I mean, I knew it was composability. It was obvious in the animations. It's obvious in a lot of like sizes can go anywhere. It can combine sizes and fluid sizes. So, but I hadn't remembered that, you know, one of the popular things people do with Tailwind that Tailwind doesn't like that people do is compose the at apply um, function where people can take two or more classes and merge them together in a single class is yeah. really popular yet shunned and holy cow open props that's sort of the default behavior it wants you to do yeah it's is, like encouraged that's like when you realize it's how it's working yeah interesting that's a cool little prop thanks appreciate that yeah uh, um but yeah there's more more vars in here so we have like capability variables so like the the input is it a stylus is it touch so just giving these things nice names hd colors you don't have to remember dynamic range high dark light so os preference variables and then extended ones for things that are coming down the pipeline like high contrast low contrast which shipped in chromium recently opacity so it prefers reduced transparency which you can set in um, mac os and windows but anyway um it's just yeah and then here oh here's usage Right, so here's a transform. So we're translating something like off the screen, and then we're saying, "Hey, if media is okay, then go ahead and transition that." 
And I use this type of code block in my CSS all the time. Same thing with this one. We're at media OS dark. I'm like, okay, if the operating system is in dark, here's some new styles. Um, and I just think these read so well. So I'm just shipping these to you. I'm like, here, poof, import them and walk away. They don't do anything to your styles uh, unless you use them. And most of the time, it's just going to be you swapping the usage with like a media query. So I thought these were really clever. Uh, most people don't make it down to the bottom of this page to see these or they yeah. don't quite understand what it is they're giving. Um, but I think this is a good future play. And I'm excited to see where this spec goes and to see it, uh, yeah, how many people are using the custom media. Yeah, no, all of this is it's pretty cool. And I, I think it's it's like I said, it's it's kind of an interesting new approach that I hope catches on a bit because I think you're you're on to something here. And it's a pretty innovative way of approaching I don't know, something we've been doing for a long time. So I think that's kind of exciting in and of itself. Awesome. Thanks. Um, actually, I think the last thing, um, and if Chad has any questions, I'll, we're coming up on our time, so please get in the questions now. You do have one fan in chat. Uh, Nimish, uh, I'm, I'm horrible with, with Twitch names, but Nimish uh, likes your tool. We've had a couple other good comments as well. Um, so very exciting. I do want to ask you though, um, the open source nature of this, like has the project, have you been like surprised by the response you've gotten, like the the interest, like, cause I know you have some background in open source as well. So maybe you could tell me how that's going and also sort of related to that, like hit me with some links to here before we wrap up of like, people want to check this out or like get involved, like where, where should we send them as well? Perfect, perfect segue. Um, yeah, the pr the project has done much better than I thought. Um, I thought I would just be shipping. It felt more opinionated when I launched it. I was like, ah, this is kind of, it's very Adam. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it felt that way. But at the end, once people started getting into it and I heard their comments and I saw them using it, like it's been really fun to watch people on Twitch or watch people on YouTube use it. And I'm like, this is fascinating the way that they are working and how helpful uh, open props looks. They're just genuinely curious and and being playful. This is like all the sorts of things I like to do. But then it has this business side where like you can use this for very, very real things. There's nothing about this that's a toy. Um, and yeah, reception has been super good. I've been really impressed. The, um, the GitHub repo has been really exciting and full of life and vibrancy. So I think I have a couple of those things pulled up. Um, like here's a conversation going on about icons. Uh, well, on here, and I'll share the discussion link. If you here. throw it in the, um, yep. yeah, I was, you did exactly what I was going to say. If you toss them in, if if you toss them in that chat, it. I'll forward it along. Yep. Keep awesome. going. <laughs> here's a here's a masks conversation. So here's a, someone submitting a whole bunch of masks that we can just use as a custom property. So here, check out some of the demos here. Oh, man. Um, and so the masks won't ship in the main repo or like with the main bundle, but there'll be something that you could just import. And look, you want to you want to have little jagged edges? Just import them and assign them. So it'd be like zigzag mask right, or uh, and you just set the mask to that that side. Um, here's some other ones, like little cutouts and doilies, uh, little archways. Look at this one's kind of drippy. Um, corner effects that you can hover, and these are just variables. You'll just assign it, and then you'll get the effect. So yeah. we're really, really kind of like, pushing what can go into a property and what's useful. Like here's some other fun things. Um, patterns are going to come, right? Why do we have to go to a pattern website all the time when I just want checkerboard? Like why not just set background var checkerboard? That would be yeah. amazing, right? So it's like how many of these things can we come up with and ship? And then there's like really future ones like uh, app property. I'm personally very excited about app property, which probably not very many other people are, but like you can use app property to make CSS counters. You can animate gradients with it. It has all these like niche superpowers. And what I want to do is give you a custom property that's defined with app property uh, that becomes built in with like, okay, let's consider this. You want to go from zero to a hundred on something. I can give you an app property that's built for that. It's built to be a percentage from zero to a hundred percent. And now you can go use it in a gradient. So you put the variable, uh, this little magic variable in the middle of a gradient, you can animate that on hover. And that thing is just, I'm just giving you pre-made ready to go um, niche animation variables um, that, yeah, it just goes from zero to hundred, for example. So it's like, wherever you want something to animate from zero to hundred, go use this cool magic property. 
it's typed and ready for browsers to animate. So if you're interested in like adding properties or you want to suggest properties, you want to go see what properties are coming down the line, like HD color, like I really want to ship um, color and display P3 and just color in LCH and lab, like these new color formats and color gamuts coming down the pipeline into the browser uh, so that my library is shipping really vibrant, beautiful colors um, and making it easy for you to use so that you're like, I don't even know that color six is an HD color. I just yeah. used color purple six and it turned out to be beautiful. And uh, that was all the library. So come here uh, to the discussions area to see more of those things. There are a couple issues uh, that you could probably contribute to if you want, or if you find bugs, like bugs have been found. Um, there's tasks in here, like document the de uh, Figma design token import flow. We've got that here. Like if you go to, oh, that's also, yeah, uh, Open Props has official, well, it's, there's a draft spec for design tokens, but we follow that and you can find the JSON here. So you can import these tokens anywhere uh, that, you know, design tokens work. And that's kind of fun. So, okay, yeah, I think I covered some of the stuff in the end there, like where to go and... Um, yeah, it looks like you have you know, a, coming down. a Discord available as well. Uh, there is... is a Discord, yeah. So check it out here. Um, jump in there. I, I help pretty quickly in there. That's also been really fun. Um, lots of good comments, lots of good use cases. Generally, it's people trying to integrate it with uh, some sort of framework. The only framework that's been tricky so far, there's only been one, which is kind of amazing, is Next.js. And Next.js is using a very strict version of CSS modules. And, um, oh, wait, Open Props works with Next.js if you're just importing the bundles. It's the JIT Props plugin that doesn't work with Next.js yet. We're trying to work that out. So Is it like they're fighting over the, like, which, which, which parser is going to win sort of thing? or It's more like um, the JIT Props plugin puts custom properties into the root of a CSS file that it's been run against. So if you run it against main.css, um, my JIT Props plugin will look for variables find the variable that you used and put it in the root of main.css. Well, root is an impure selector in CSS modules because it can't be um, scoped. Oh, scoped, right? yeah, okay. And so the fact that um, the JIT props plugin can't push to somewhere else, like the global style sheet or something like that in Next.js, we have to figure out basically a way to give the open props, JIT, well, give the JIT props plugin a specific file so it would be like, yeah, global.css that's loaded in your index file of Next.js. And then the JIT Pops plugin is putting things there and Next.js won't be sad anymore um, about impurity because it's we're putting things where it's expecting impurity. And and yeah, those conversations <laughs> happen in the Discord and, and they're really good. Yeah, um, I, I like that. I, I think I'm totally going to steal this like little need help call out for a readme that's like super handy. So I think I'm totally copying and pasting that. <laughs> for awesome. some of my Do own it. stuff because that's handy <laughs> and cool over uh, hey man i want to thank you this has been a lot of fun i hope people found this interesting i definitely did uh i wish you the best i think you got something really interesting really cool here cool thanks appreciate that and appreciate you having me on the show asking great questions and hope i hope i shared valuable stuff about it yeah, if people want like to reach out to you personally, uh, should we drop your your Twitter in here? What's a good place to reach out to you if they want to yeah, follow you and such? Twitter, Twitter is great. I'm on there um, sharing all sorts of CSS related stuff all the time. So here is that link. Um, but the Discord is also good. So if you have questions about open props, if you're using it for something, whatever it is, uh, send it my way. I'm I'm interested. Want to check it out? Cool. And we just threw that in the chat. Um, and again, this is React Wednesdays, so. Yeah, come join us. If you're watching this on YouTube, come hang out with us live. It's a lot of fun. You can ask questions for people. We do it every Wednesday. So make sure to check out the site in the description. All right, everybody. Until next week. Thanks again, Adam. Bye, everybody.